So today we are very excited to have Emmanuel Alvarez Chavez, a PhD student at Simtech University of Stuttgart in Germany, as our speaker in our session. And um, Manuel is going to be discussing uh, model development and how this process could benefit from machine learning and information theory. Um, so the floor is all yours, uh, Manuel. Okay, thank you, Leila, for the very nice introduction. I'll share my screen. This one, second. One second. I think you're able to see my presentation now. Yes, it looks great. OK, perfect. Let me use a laser pointer. Yeah, perfect. OK. So yes, uh, good, well, in my case, good morning, everyone. I'll be speaking a little bit about model development. And based on this paper, you, you can already see that this is model development for hydrological models. But at the end, and in this case, distributed hydrological models, but at the end, I'll also try to speak about a little bit more about uh, how this process of model development could benefit from uh, machine learning and also from information theory. So the content of this presentation is uh, divided into two parts. So the first part of the presentation is based on the paper that uh, I suggested for reading uh, in this session. So this is uh, this paper by Fabrizio Frenizio on 2016. And the main idea of this paper is to anal analyze key modeling decisions in uh, the model development process of a distributed hydrological model. And these are some of the stages that they describe in the paper, but I'll talk a little bit about uh, these stages more in, in further slides. And the second part of this presentation is related to more related to machine learning, where I'll try to talk a little bit about state space model, and in this case, neural state space models. Also about this new architecture that it, uh, for state space models that is becoming very popular recently, which is called Mamba, which is based on this paper by Guan Dao from last year. And then I'll try to uh, bring everything together through the paradigm of the variational information bottleneck, which could serve as a way of, of building future models, uh, not only in hydrology, but I think in general for any application that you can think about. So starting with part one, uh, I'll start with the conclusions of the paper. And I, I think that the conclusions give a very nice summary of the overall the insights that can be gained through reading this paper. So this paper presents a, an iterative methodology for the development of distributed hydrological models. And in this paper, they describe three key modeling decisions that happens that happen along this process. So the first key decision is landscape classification into hydrological response units. The second key modeling decision is the selection of model structures to be associated with the individual hydrological response units. And the third uh, key modeling decision is thinking of parameters across different hydrological response units. And one of the figures that they use throughout the paper is this uh, very nice schematic where you can see the different steps that they present in, in this approach to building a model, which is this first stage where you are discretizing your, your study area. And in this first stage, you also start with a very generic structure for a, for a specific model. And then in the second stage, you start to reduce this uh, very generic model into a more parsimonious model, which is reflective of each um, different uh, subcatchment or hydrological response unit that you're analyzing. And in the third stage, you are uh, building relationships between different uh, hydrological response units through the parameters that the models are using. And 
another thing that they highlight in this paper is the benefits of this, uh, of building models as sets of multiple working hypotheses. So when they come up with one, uh, or when they move in one of the steps of the key modeling decisions, what they describe is that they are coming up with a new hypothesis for the model that is built for this study area. And this uh, new hypothesis have to always be validated against observed data. And following this model development as multiple working hypotheses brings benefits, such as in the improved predictive performance of the models, improved model parsimony, and quantitative and qualitative modeling insights that complement the experimental process understanding. Um, so to start and going from the conclusions now to the start of the paper, I want to discuss the philosophies for model development. So they describe two different philosophies for model development in this paper. The first one is this bottom-up approach in which the system behavior is characterized through a detailed representation of the system, systems, processes, and interactions. So you're really going to the very fine scale of the system and try, and, and try to model all of the processes that are happening at, at a very fine scale in the system. And they mentioned that this approach has some shortcomings. So at the scale, because you are starting from a very fine scale, this approach is not generally applicable to, uh, to the scale of a catchment, so a very large area. This approach also has very high data requirements. And in some cases, uh, this approach might not give you the best tools for the research questions that arise at the catchment scale. So in this fine scale, you might not uh, be able to answer the questions that you are that you would like to ask of your models. And then in, from the complete opposite side, you have the top-down approach in which um, there's a parsimonious, parsimonious description of the emergent properties of the entire system. And this is where uh, conceptual hydrological models uh, come into the picture, where you have abstract representations of catchment me uh, mechanisms using state variables. And, and this idea of having state variables is very important because when you're modeling uh, a catchment, what you're really doing is modeling a, a dynamical system and dynamical systems are uh, very often represented by these state variables and also parameters. And in the case of, uh, of a catchment or a natural system, these state variables and parameters in this conceptual framework may not correspond directly to observable quantities. And they do also mention in the paper that although model classification or these model classifications such as top down, uh, bottom up, conceptual, completely physical, uh, these classifications are generally helpful, but in practice, uh, mm. when you're building a model, this process is, uh, or the distinction between this process, uh, these different classifications is blurred, and it's not really clear cut. So you can bring together different uh, components of, of all of these categories into building the model that you want uh, for your study area. So one of the examples uh, that they give for this approach of different modeling uh, working hypotheses is that um, well, model decisions represent multiple working hypotheses, as I said. So each decision that you make uh, represents a new hypothesis that you're coming up with. So for example, and they give an example using top model, which is a very standard uh, hydrological model, that in one case in a catchment in the Andes, they add a parallel storage to the conceptual framework of, of top model. And this, uh, this adding of a parallel storage is a new hypothesis that you're making for the model of, of this specific study area. So it's a modification also of the top model structure. And this modification that you made of the top model structure improved uh, your model. And uh, so when tested, Against observed data, your your hypothesis was true, so to say, and they say that this parallel storage can be reflected in the natural system as a, a series of disconnected wetlands and, and depressions. So, 
um, you have a standard model, which is your initial hypothesis, and then you may come on modification that becomes a new hypothesis of the model. And then you test it against uh, observed data and you see improvement. So your hypothesis is validated. And this approach also uh, supports having a flexible modeling framework. So as you can, from the example, you can see that they add a parallel storage to an existing model. So the idea of a flexible model and framework is that you are able to pick and choose the different components of your of the model that you want to build, and then how these components are connected between them is something that you can also define. So that that's one of the advantages that these flexible modeling frameworks have. And then going into specific specifically to distributed hydrological models. And the key decisions that we'll see throughout this paper is uh, are these three, so spatial discretization, the definition of the structures and the connectivity between the structures of the models, and then the specification of the constraints of the parameters and the, spa uh, and the state space of, of these models. So that was a lot for the introduction. Uh, this is where the, where the more applied part of the paper comes up. So the idea is to Build a distributed hydrological model from uh, for this study area, which is a mesoscale catchment of the Adder River in Luxembourg. So it's 300 square kilometers. And one of the things that they highlight is that uh, it is important to consider in 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 this initial step of of the discretization of the study area, the different hydrological response units that you can that you could have if you would subdivide the study area by topography or geology. So in, in the picture, in this figure, you can see the catchment and you can see the classification that was made based on, on geology. And in the next slide, I'll show the classification that uh, could be done using topography. And, and you, could, you will be able to see that there's some intersection when, where these two fit, but there are some other parts where uh, they do not match. So when building your hydrological response units, you have to make a decision if you uh, develop them based on a classification of geology or um, topography. And this is one of the hypotheses that they also test in this in this paper. And this is all, and this hypothesis is also informed by previous studies. So it is part of the paper, but it more or less the outcome of, of this hypothesis was already known from the past but is something that is also tested in this paper. And another thing that they do is that they have different, uh, they have 10 gauging stations. So one of the things that they want to do with uh, this distributed hydrological model is to be able to validate it in space. Uh, so by transferring uh, models between different sub subcatchments, also in time by applying models in different periods of time and also in space time. So transferring, uh, models from different gauging stations and also during different periods of, of time. So this is something that they also do. And this validation, for example, that uh, uh, this space time and space time validation that they do could be, for example, a model is calibrated in this group B of subcatchments in during period one and then validated in, the, in group A of, of the subcatchments during period two. So this would be a space-time validation. And as I said, this is the, the other map. So this is the classification that you would be able to make uh, of the catchment based on topography. So you can see that there are some parts that match, some others that not. In the end, uh, the best uh, models that can be built for this study area are based uh, more in the classification by, by geology, but that is something that we'll see uh, in further slides. So this is uh, a scheme that they show into how the the overall catchment model is built. So as, as I said, you have the overall catchment, then you have subcatchments that are defined by the gauging stations that you have, and then you have hydrological response units, which are based on, on depending on, on the classification that you chose on geology or topography. And you can see that this scheme of how this it, this could be seen in a catchment, for example. So you have this. Um, so you have subcatchments, which are defined by the different gauging stations. 
And then you have also hydrological response units that in this case, for example, could be uh, different types of geology. And then they add another component into the subdivision that they name fields. So it's the intersection between the subcatchments and the hydrological response units. And I will not go into a lot of detail into why they make this subdivision into fields, but one of the, and I would, I would not do that because it's uh, related to the meteorological inputs that they, they use for, for the model. So uh, what they do is that, uh, for example, a rainfall event is the same uh, across all the uh, subcatchment, for example. So this subcatchment would have a specific rainfall event and this subcatchment would have uh, a slight variation because all rainfall is spatially varied in time. So they just average the specific event of, of this subcatchment. And then in each hydrological response unit, you have different model structures. So you have to take into account then, uh, the different model structure and also the different meteorological input. And that's why they subdivide into also fields. But the most important, uh, overall, that's not so important for the outcome of the paper. I think the most important thing is to remember this subdivision of subcatchments uh, also by hydrological response units. And this is the initial model that they, they use. Um, and this is what they call the a generic model. So the initial model structure that they choose um, is chosen as such so that it's sufficiently complex to accommodate a, a relatively broad uh, range of processes. And later is for this um, very complex or sufficiently complex model will be tailored to specific structures and specific processes that are perceived to be dominant in a specific hydrological response unit. And this process of tailoring is also informed by previous studies. So uh, when they, well, this is the initial model that they choose for the, or for all of the hydrological response units. But then when they do the subdivision into hydrological response units given by the geology, each of the geologies will have a, a slightly different model that it is tailored to this specific uh, geological formation. So you can see that the models, all of them are very similar to this initial generic, mo uh, generic model. But one thing that they remove is the lower reservoir because they say that uh, there's no lower reservoir due to the limited groundwater processes. They say that there is, are groundwater processes, but they are not so highly complex and can be captured by a single reservoir. So they, that's why they have a single storage. And then each specific um, geological formation um, has a, 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 a tailored model for that specific geology. So for example, schist is a very, it's very similar to the initial model. And what they do with schist is that uh, this lag function is kept to represent uh, a delay or a pronounced delay into the, the stream flow response. And as you go down into these uh, geological classifications, uh, the, the models become a little bit simpler. So you can see that in Marl, uh, this lag function is removed because, yes, there's a question. I just, just for clarification, Manuel, the SU storage, is that interception storage or is that some kind of- This upper... is the, this is an, uh, the unsaturated zone. So it's a reservoir with a threshold, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so Marl is a little bit simpler than, than Schist. So they remove the, the lag function because there's not such pronounced delay between stream flow. Then there's sandstone, which what you can see with sandstone is that the response of the storage in this case is a nonlinear function. But they say that in the case of sandstone, that the response of sandstone is simpler. So they substitute this nonlinear response to a linear response. So you have a single parameter in the computation of the output of the model from, from the from the storage. And then lastly, what you have is alluvium, which 
they say that, well, in alluvium, there is no unsaturated zone because alluvium is typically saturated and is permanently connected to the stream. So, uh, so again, this is a quicker response and it is a response that is also linear. So because there, it is connected directly to the stream, so it's a very quick response. So this is the model structures that they chose to, to build the overall distributed model. And one of the things that are, and, and this, as I said, this process or these structures that they choose are informed by previous studies that were uh, realized in this study area. So one of the things that I would have liked to see is, for example, the, the mistakes that were done in coming up with this different model structures, because as I said, these are model structures that are informed by previous studies, but it would have been, and this is something that probably happens in, in the previous paper, but it would be nice to see how you analyze the data and come up with a model structure and you find that the model structure that you defined is not correct, so your performance decreases, and slowly you tailor. Um, so to come up with this final model structures that you see in this picture, it would be nice to see how this were slowly modified into you. You came up with this model structures that you see in this picture. And that's basically it for the model development part. The next part is uh, seeing, uh, well, testing the models against the observed data and seeing the performance of, of the different models. So first, uh, I'll try to describe the different models that are presented in, the, in these plots. So the initial model that they use is a uniform model, or what they call a uniform model. So it's it's a long model for uh, for the whole catchment that uses the generic model structure that uh, I showed I showed in the beginning. The second hypothesis that they present, and these are the five hypotheses that are presented in this paper. So the second hypothesis that they present is. Uh, a model that is that has its hydrological response units defined by the topography. So, uh, yeah. So the, the different hydrological response units are given by the classification made in terms of topography, and then come up the hydrological the models that have hydrological response units that are based on the geological classification, and this is where you start to see. Um, increases in performance. In this case, uh, it, these plots are showing the uh, log likelihood of, of the parameters that are um, found for the specific model that I'm showing. Uh, and yeah, so you can see increases in performance. And then you have the second uh, set of, geo, uh, of models that are based on hydrological response units on geology, which are the, the ones that use tailored structures for the hydrological response units. And the last uh, model and the final hypo hypothesis of the study is uh, a model where the unsaturated zone shares the parameters between hydrological response units. So they say that the processes that happen in, in the unsaturated zone can be related between different hydrological response units. So they, this last model uses the same threshold for the unsaturated zone. So following the picture that I showed at the beginning, uh, it's where you see the linkage between different parameters in different hydrological response units. And well, uh, this is in, in the calibration pro or well to calibrate these models, they use Bayesian uh, weighted least squares. And in this case, it, it's a Bayesian optimization scheme. And what they use uh, as the likelihood function is the residual errors or the likelihood function is given by residual errors that are statistically independent and can be described by a Gaussian distribution. So this is the first plot that they show in terms of performance. And the next one is based on the nash Sutcliffe efficiency. So it may be a little bit simpler to understand where you have, uh, well, the higher the nash Sutcliffe efficiency is, the better the model is performing. Uh, and nash Sutcliffe efficiency also have a maximum of, of one. So you can see how, in this case, the models that are based on geology are the ones that are performing best. 
and not only in the calibration setting, that one of the things that they do is uh, they abandon, uh, they say that validation in time is simpler than validation in space. So for this uh, second set of results, they only calibrate the models on the second period of the data that is available. And what they um, show in this second plot is uh, the spatial transferability that this model has, that the models that they train have uh, in space and time. So they are calibrating in this in a specific set of catchments, uh, subcatchments, so uh, group num group B, and in the second period, and they also are also calibrating on the first uh, on the A group of subcatchments, also on the second period, and then they are validated on the on group B of subcatchments on period one, and also on uh, group A of subcatchments on, on period one. So they are testing this space time validation. And again, they find that the, the performance of the model increase as you move uh, into the later steps of the decisions that are made in the modeling process. Next, something that they show is also in, in the optimization process that they, uh, that they use. Uh, as I understood, they use a quasi-Newton scheme. So you, there's from the total number of steps that the model optimization process takes, you can see how the uh, slowly uh, the log and what they say from this uh, behavior that you can see in this plot of having different steps as the performance of the model increases uh, is that these steps only happen in, in more parsimonious, uh, parsimonious models. And this is because these more parsimonious models have fewer local optima and have, uh, and therefore have better parameter identifiability. So you can see in MGO2 and MGO3, you can see distinct steps where the where the model is uh, significantly improving until you reach the maximum, and there is no further improvement. Uh, another of the results that they show is what I like to call the eyeball check of the um, predictive capacity of the model. So basically plotting the observed data against the predictions that the model make. And you can also see this behavior of improvement that happens across as you move further into these key decisions in, in model development. So you start with um, the uniform model, which has predictions that are uh, very large uh, prediction limits. Well, this is uh, a Bayesian uh, optimization or what they calibrate the models with is, is a Bayesian optimization scheme. So therefore you can get prediction limits. And you can see that in the case of the initial model, you, your data is within the, the prediction limits that the model is able to make. But these prediction limits are very large. And also the mean predictions are not very close to the different uh, observed data points that you have. And as you move throughout this chain of, of modeling decisions, your prediction limits become uh, more narrow. And also the mean, and also the observed data falls within these prediction limits that your model is able to make. And also the mean predictions that your model makes tend to fall within the or tend to be close to the observed data that, that you're calibrating against. And finally, in this, uh, in the development of this uh, third or MGO3, which is the third model that shares different par parameters between uh, in the unsaturated zone, is where you can see that in individual calibration of the different uh, geologies, you have a certain uh, threshold for this unsaturated zone reservoir. So this is what makes them think that the model could share this parameter between hydrological response units. And therefore, for the, for the transition between uh, MGO2 and MGO3, they chose to use the same uh, threshold for, uh, for all the hydrological response units. And you can see that 
in identifying this parameter, they also have uh, narrower or of well, the parameters identified and the also the confidence interval or the prediction intervals for this parameter are narrower. So this is what makes them believe that, well, this is a, a process that is shared between different hydrological response units. Therefore, it can be modeled by the same uh, specific structure that was chosen for the models, which will share the same parameter because it's a process that is shared between uh, hydrological response units. So uh, going back to the beginning, again, from the conclusions, and these are more specific conclusions of the study area given by the, by the analysis that they follow in, in the paper. Uh, as I said, there are three key modeling decisions that they make. And in regards to this study area in this initial uh, modeling decision, where, which is the discretization of the study area, they found that the stream flow response across the after catchment appears to be related to geological variability. On the second key modeling decision, they find that hydrological behavior of different geological units can be represented by a distinct and simple model structures. These structures reflect dominant processes in the hydrological response units. And the final decision, which is, very, which is for the parameters of the specific processes within the hydrological response units, uh, they find that parameters can be linked between hydrological response units. And this means that the variability in stream flow is not produced by specific model components that use set parameter, but the discretization into hydrological units formulated in the first stage uh, of the modeling decisions. And that's very much it for the paper. And what, I'm, what I would like to continue talking about is how I could see this process benefiting from uh, machine learning and information theory. So taking it from this top-down approach that was demonstrated in this article, the, these key decisions could be uh, informed in a certain way by neural networks and information theory. So using the same scheme that they use for the, for the paper uh, that represents the different modeling decisions, for example, if there's not so much uh, available data on previous studies about the specific study area, you could think about starting uh, based on a neural network, which would inform you, for example, on the number of states that your study area has or that you are supposed to model. And then you can slowly um, go from this state representation that is given by a neural network into a state representation that is similar to what they show in this in this paper of different model structures tailored to uh, geological units. But certain processes could also benefit from by being modeled by smaller neural networks where not where, for example, you haven't identified the specific behavior that schist or marl or alluvium would have in the study area. So th these are when I was describing the models, I, I was saying that they say that alluvium, for example, has a linear response. What if this linear response, or what if that is not a decision that has to be made, but could be modeled by the neural network? So how would the data and the neural network, or, or the data that would be processed by the neural network would inform uh, the specific response that a specific uh, geological unit would have? And lastly, what I would think is that this approach could also benefit um, from something like the information bottleneck, where you are reaching a balance between the expressiveness of your model, so the predictive capacity of your model. So in, in this case, the state representation of your system is given by set, and the output of, of the model is y. So this is predictive capacity. And then the, the model that you're developing is also able to discriminate uh, the input data that you're giving it in order to build uh, a state representation that is able to compress uh, the, the input data that you're giving the model. But it's, again, you're having this uh, trade-off between the predictive capacity of your model or, or it, its expressiveness 
and the compression that you're making uh, of the input data. So uh, I will go more into detail, but uh, and this is based on part two, where I'll, I'll be talking about sequence models and uh, the vari variational information bottleneck. But if there are, and this is, and this second part is not uh, based on the on the paper that was suggested for for this uh, for this session. So if there are any questions about the paper specifically, I could take them now or just go into the uh, the next part about state space models and and variational information bottleneck. Yep, there's a question. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so in the last slide, you showed the the information bottleneck. I mean, I've seen this in in the context of fairness, but I'm just uh, wondering for this compression term, what is like what's an example of what X and Z would be? The well, X X is your input data, Z is your state representation, and Y is the the predictions that your model are is making. So what you're trying to do with this information bottleneck is to reach uh, a balance between the information that is that it, this the the input data or how the input data is able to inform this state space. So you are trying to discriminate as much of the uh, information in the input that is for not necessary for the model. And then you're maximizing the predictive capacity between this uh, state space and the predictions that the model makes. So, this is, some, this is a quantity you, that you're trying to maximize. This is something, this is a, a loss function and it can be expressed as minimizing or, or maximizing, but in, in how I'm, I am presenting it here, it would be maximizing the expressiveness of the model or the predictive capacity, it, balanced by the compression that you're making by the model. It is kind of a bit confusing that we want basically here to minimize the compression. If I recall from the from the workshop we had um, a, 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 a machine learning model learning means compression. Maximize the compression. It's the other way yeah, around. So why do you want to minimize the compression here? No, this is supposed to be maximized, not minimized. No, I, I thought, uh, as, as, as Manuel said, we want to maximize this quantity. This means to minimize the compression. No, we're minimizing this quantity. You're minimizing the mutual information be between the input and the state space. So what you want is that the 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 state space gets only what it needs from the inputs. So, so should the bracket to... then include the minus? Or I don't know, something's weird. No, th th this is a, a negative sign. So this is, and this is mutual information between the inputs and, and the state space. So what you want is that the state space get, gets only what it, what it needs from the inputs and it's able to discriminate everything that is useless from, from, the, output, from the input, sorry. So mutual just, information, but just from the mutual, schematic, just from the schematic, if the minus is in front of compression, mm -hmm. and we want to maximize the entire sum, then we want to minimize compression, which is weird, right? Well, you want to minimize the mutual information between inputs and state space. This is something. Well, compression is something that I added, so it might be using. Is, yeah, maybe I'm using uh, so making wrong. Yeah, making mutual information small is compression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah. Okay. I I see. Okay. So it's 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 even more conceptual. Okay. I get it. Okay. All right. Okay. Now I understand. Yeah. So thanks, Manuel. I have a short question, but maybe you'll answer it later on. Anyways, how do you go about um, 
that you're not having individual values, you know, for one point in time, but you, you're acting and evaluating time series. So how do you evaluate the mutual information between whatever your input time series and your, your state space representation time series mm -hmm. point by point? That is something that I'm, I'm still looking into. I have seen, uh, well, I, I also have seen a couple of papers where this is applied in molecular dynamics, which is a time series. And I have also seen uh, the method applied in, in financial time series. So in, in this particular context, I will be just talking in a general sense of the idea of the information bottleneck, but you can go into specifics for time series and I can point into it towards examples where they are doing exactly this. So in molecular dynamics, you have uh, the trajectory of, um, of a dynamical system in time. So this is something that they are applying in that field. But in, in this, I'm just uh, yeah, thinking very generally about how a model could be built on this principle of, uh, of the information bottleneck. So I will not go into a lot of specifics. Maybe what makes it a little bit more complicated to understand is that X and Z are both vectors. Yep. And they could be of different dimensions. Uh, but they're but they're but they're both time series vectors. Yeah. Time time series of vectors. Mm -hmm. Joseph. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, uh, yeah. This next question is about the paper itself. So, um. There's, a, I mean, I, I've done a, a bit of work on, you know, adding constraints to diff different models or um, adding some extra module to a model and seeing if it improves predictive capability. And, and sometimes in those instances, you add some constraint that must be true, but it reduces predictive capability, right? And this is seems to be a common problem in hydrology because of all the noise and everything, all the complexity. Uh, so do you think predictive capability is reliable, a, a reliable indicator of uh, choosing between different hypotheses? Uh, especially because, you know, if you add some complicated model that really should be part of the system, a as you showed in one of those plots, the optimization could get a lot more complicated. And, you know, maybe you're not optimizing correctly. Maybe uh, the optimization just gets more difficult. Maybe uh, the data is off in some certain way. So, yeah, just uh, I guess my general question is how how reliable is predictive capability? Do you think? Yeah, that, that's something that I also struggle a, a lot with because, well, in theory, if you are, you add uh, a specific component of a model that represents a process that you know that is happening in your catchment, uh, so your model is being more, oh, how do you say like? more representative or more fidelis, I think would be the word to the natural system. I think you would expect predictive capacity to improve, but as you say, that may be something, sometimes not the case. And that is something also that they mentioned in, in the introduction of this paper, where they say, well, we are evaluating the models on predictive, you know, on predictive capacity, but predictive capacity is not everything. So you would want, for example, to be able to ask a specific question uh, of your model about a process that you're, uh, of a process that you know that it's happening. But if you add this process, 
the overall performance of the model decreases. But now you can ask this specific uh, question to the model. So it's, it's also a question about what you want the model for. So yeah, it, it's a difficult question and, and it, it is something that I often also struggle with. Yeah, I often like like doing this type of thing, but it's I I never feel like I'm satisfied afterwards. It, it never really gives me a definitive answer, which is frustrating sometimes. But yeah. Question, I think you raise your hand first. Uh, just two thoughts that came up. One is that um, the uh, information bottleneck equation that's on here can be also thought of as balancing predictive capability and parsimony. So the first term can be thought of as maximizing predictive capability. And uh, as you increase compression, you're, you're um, increasing parsimony of the model. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention was I've been reading about um, neural architecture search. And one of the interesting things that happens when um, you increase model complexity in neural architecture search is that performance initially goes down. And then, uh, uh, and so when you do neural architecture search, you have to be very careful to not eliminate uh, that more complex architecture early on, uh, just because performance went down, uh, you have to give it time for the system to um, massage that new architecture or you know, change its parameters, or change other assumptions, whatever. Uh, um, uh, uh, for a sufficiently long period of evolution uh, so that it can actually manifest its full potential. And uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is in that regard is that you, you, you're not, you should not be measuring predictive capability on the training data, but you're measuring it on some external generalization thing. So uh, this thing about as you increase complexity of hypotheses is a little bit more nuanced than simply just adding a new architecture and then testing it. I also have a question about the compression term. So let's say you have one lump model that minimizes mutual information between your input data and, and the state space. Um, and you have a distributed, highly distributed model that all have the same parameters that will all, you know, look the same. Under this compression, um, they will be equally compressing. But um, so your, I, my question is, do you somehow also measure the degree of redundancy simply in your representation or not? It doesn't seem to be in there right now and it's not in the original bottleneck. So that would be my question. I think it would be on the dimension on this of the state page because I think if you build a a lump model with a specific set of states, um, which is I would guess smaller than a distributed model with a larger number of states because you're different modeling different components. I guess the but compression just for term... sim sorry. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. But just for, for simplicity, let's assume we have a distributed model, but all have exactly the same parameters and they will, you know, go down in perfect synchronization. The mutual information of this high dimensional state space representation with the input data will be exactly the same as if you would have done that with a single lumped model. So you, you couldn't see the difference in this compression uh, punishment or penalty function, but you would obviously see it in the size of your model. That's what I'm wondering if model size somehow um, appears in there too. We are not sure what you said is completely accurate because the mutual information doesn't depend only on the size of the state space. It also depends on the values of the states. 
and the values of the states change when you change the parameters. And if you add more parameters, you can, with the same size state space, you can improve the mutual information. Does that not make sense? Yeah, of course, you have the option, but let's say I'm silly and I'm just repeating the same small catchment with the same parameters a hundred times mm -hmm. distributed over the catchment. And they just do exactly the same thing, just that the the, the size of uh, the number of variables I'm storing um, has increased by a factor of 100. And uh, this would not appear in this penalty function. Of course, you have the the option to improve expressiveness, so that would help on the other side, but you don't necessarily have to. But are you, saying, but are you saying that you're, you're changing the mutual information or you're saying that it stays the same? I, I didn't quite follow. So the mutual information between X and Z would remain the same. And um, if I'm not varying the distributed model elements the mutual information between Z and Y would also remain the same, oh. but I'd have I'd do this with a larger model. But if you but if if your Z values are all the same going up and down, then you're basically saying that you only have one state. So yeah, just that I'm stupid enough to express that in a hundred states, and that, so I'm just wondering if this quantity would also appear somewhere in this information bottleneck equation that you want to apply because it would feel like a desirable quantity to minimize also. This is where you would prefer to use description length rather than. Uh, yeah, description length would come into play here. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. I think they resume in the information bottleneck theory, they're assuming a minimal description, but I don't know if they explicitly said it. it's been a long time since I read the paper. Uh, what was this link you put in, Joseph? Information bottleneck is not unique. Oh, I just, yeah. Uh, it, it doesn't give you a, a unique Z. So, oh, of course not. Yeah, yeah. of course not. Because you can always transform Z through any nonlinear transformation and preserve non mutual information. Yeah. Or you can also transform. Well, it, it has to be one to one, but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, as as yeah, as long as long as it's an invertible transformation, you preserve yeah. or none. Right. Thanks, uh, and we had a great presentation. He hasn't so finished yet. <laughs> oh yeah, but for the first part, the hydrologic modeling insights, I, I guess, um, yeah, I, I mean, this is kind of a the first approach I've seen on how to handle spatially distributed measurements. Um, and, and one of the questions that I like from the paper is this, um, how do the, the, the part where you they talk about their representation and they, they do it based on geology and geography. And I guess this raises more questions than answers um, because you would think some other watersheds that are more flat, think about the Great Plains in the US where watersheds are more flat, um, the geology wouldn't be so important as the conditions of the surface, for example. Uh, or the topography will become relevant. So I guess from the beginning, there's a need to determine what's the best representation, what's the best distribution. Is it uh, HRUs? Is it topography, the topo index? Is it the sandstone or the lithology? What is it that drives the, what is it that encodes the most information from the beginning? So you're not, you're not inventing your parameters to accommodate the non-uniqueness problem that you're resolving. And, and that's one thing that I um that I that I think probably that should be one way to advance. Um, the other thing you mentioned there in the paper that was 
um, pretty cool to me was the, the fact that uh, validation in space is more difficult than validation in time. Uh, so how do we actually do validation in space? Or do we want to actually understand processes? Or just we, we just want to come up with a good time series at, at certain rain gauges, at certain stream flow gauges. Um, that's something really cool that you said there that I think was not fully resolved, but um, they're clearly doing um, validation in time at discrete points in space. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, those are kind of some points of reflection here. All right, thanks, Hernan. Uh, let's let Manuel continue so we finish on time. Uh, I just wanted to mention, Joseph, uh, this paper of yours looks very interesting. Maybe we could get you on the list to make a presentation about it. Yeah, I could. I mean, I, I presented a HydroML, but maybe if people are interested, I can do it again. Sure. So, Leela, take note. Thanks. Sure. All right. Uh, go, go ahead, Manuel. Yeah. Okay. I will continue with part two. So, the idea of part two is just to bring, try to bring into this paradigm of uh, model development as, as, or how this paradigm of model development as key decisions could benefit from machine learning. And I already gave a, a, a very brief introduction at the end, but the idea is more because I wanted to talk about uh, sequence models and uh, sequence models that come specifically from, from machine learning and some of the things that have already been applied and some of the things that can could be applied in the future. Uh, yeah, so I'll start with neural ODEs. So the idea of, of the models that I will talk about in, in this section is that uh, they come from a data-driven approach with some with some relationship to dynamical systems in, in the sense that they try, these models try to represent uh, a state space. So what, what you have with a neural ODE is that you combine uh, a numerical solver with a neural network to ap approximate the derivative of the states of, of the system. And with the derivatives of the states of the system, you can follow the system trajectory through time and see how the system evolves in time. And, and therefore you are able to predict the state of the system in the future and then make a prediction based on the state of the system in the future. So typically what you have is, uh, is this. So in this case, in, in this very small scheme that I'm showing here, and this will be clarified by the example of, of, the, of the next paper, but you have a state representation that is given by X, and then you have uh, a neural network that is taking the state space and then the time in the future that you want to predict and a specific scheme. And then you're trying to compute the next uh, state that the model will be in. And that, that is basically your loss function. So you this can be seen more, well, in an example of hydrology, this is a paper from uh, 2022 by uh, some of the same people that uh, also participated in, in the previous paper. And what basically what you're doing is that you have this, uh, so in this case, the system is represented by two states. So in this case, it's all again hydrology. So you have a snow state and, and a water state. And then you have an initial model, which contains uh, a typical hydrological model where you're conserving mass and you have uh, some inputs and outputs to, to this uh, snow and water storages. The idea of a neural ODE is that you can approximate components of this right-hand side of the equation by neural networks. So now you don't have a, a mechanistic process that you are defining to calculate ET, but what you have is that you have a neural network that is taking the input data and predicting ET. And this is what it's going into your numerical solver to, uh, to update the state of the water. Uh, so one of, and well, in this paper, they proved that neural ODs are very successful, even when used in, in this very simple hydrological model. And one of the things that I find most interesting about neural ODs applied in this setting uh, of hydrological models 
is exactly something that we uh, I talked about about the relationships that you have or the the neural networks are able to find in the processes uh, given by the hydrological model. So these are two plots that are included in the paper, and uh, in the paper they define three different types of models in the percentage that the internals of the model or the right-hand side of, of the differential equation that you're trying to solve are replaced by neural networks. So model zero is that basically you have a mechanistic process. So you can see that, for example, the prediction of discharge is directly related to the storage of, of the system. So you can see that as, as you have more storage, uh, you have more discharge, and the rain doesn't affect this process yeah, because it is what is defined in the equation that you're defining for, for your model. But as you replace this with the neural, with neural networks, you find that this is based on the data that the, that the neural networks have available. This is not the, re, the specific relationship that they find, but the relationship that the neural networks find is different. And in some cases, uh, completely different from the uh, from the equation that you defined in, in model zero. So you can see in this case, again, as you have more water storage, uh, you have more discharge as it expected, but this is also a component that is affected by, by rainfall. And something interesting that in, in this particular example that is shown is that, for example, you even though you have more rain, and for example, the, the water storage is completely full, you're creating less discharge. So this can be a specific property of the catchment that you're analyzing. And this is also something that is reflected in, in model 100, which model 100 basically has neural networks for everything. So yeah. And the same happens with the, for example, for a calculation of evapotranspiration. So typically this is, this is the mechanistic equation that you define for calculating evapotranspiration. So as you have more water storage and the temperature is higher, you have higher evapotranspiration. But again, you can see that these uh, relationships that you're defining in the model are not the ones that are found uh, by the neural network. And also something that is important to say is that these response surfaces that you're seeing are specific for one catchment in the in the overall training set that they use for this for this paper. So this specific catchment has this specific behavior. If you would evaluate another catchment, you would find different behaviors between based on the different uh, properties that the catchment has and the proper and the processes that are happening in that specific catchment. So those are neural ODEs. And then you can go um, a little, uh, in a little bit of a step back, you can use recurrent neural networks. So recurrent neural networks have a, a hidden state. That it, this hidden state, and again, this is based on the state representation, and these states are updated using a previous state and the current input using gating operations, typically. So uh, sigmoids or hyperbolic tangents. But there is another, and in some cases, and it has been very successful with the LSTMs, these recurrent neural networks can be used to model the state space of, of, of the of the system, but there is another paradigm of modeling uh, based on these state space models that are focusing explicitly on trying to model uh, a, a dynamical system that has a, a state space representation. So it it is not a recurrent neural network, but it's a specific type of model that uses neural networks, but is the architecture that I, I will show in a little bit is specific to this uh, idea of having a state space. And this kind of models can also be used for language. Uh, and this particular one, MAMBA, which is linear time sequence modeling with selective state spaces is being proposed as something that would challenge a transformer. And the main difference between uh, this state space models and transformers is that transformers use attention. So uh, a transformer is able to look or, or anything can look at anything else. So when it, it, it is predicting within a sequence, 
the, tr the transformer is able to look back into the, the sequence and then use a, a previous step in the sequence to make a prediction. So it can selectively look back. So the transformer is not explicitly modeling a state space representation. And that is something that the, this state space models and something that Mamba is, is doing. So there's an explicit state space representation. Sorry, so just, this... to, just to clarify, Manuel. So Mamba is using both attention and... Uh... It is not using attention. It is not using attention at all. It's going back and using a state space just like the original. It's uh, using state space, the but, they, but they do have something that could be seen as similar to attention in on this. The state. Sorry? Attention is applied on the state space. Yes, but they call it selective state spaces. So the idea is that you have a, a transition matrix. Uh, I'll show the, the specific equations. But it, it can be related to attention in the sense that sometimes the input will change the updating equations that you use to update the, the, the end states. Like a context. So, okay. Exactly. So there are some specific inputs that may affect your the rules that you're using to update the, the state space. So it. it can be seen as, yeah, so some specific points in the sequence have it more weight in what is happening within the, the hidden states. So it's a little bit similar to attention. Yeah, I guess it's a linguistic thing. To me, anytime you're looking at something that's attention, it's a matter of how you modify your attention or how you adjust your attention based on context. So, okay, never mind. go ahead. Okay. So um, the most basic, uh, state space model is, well, not the most basic, but, but the one that is typically presented uh, when you see a, a, a state space model is this structured space state space sequence model, which is, is called S4. And this S4 model has uh, four parameters. So uh, this delta uh, parameter that I, that was explained a little bit, and then there are these three ABC terms that are matrices and the idea of this uh, kind of state space model is that everything is linear so everything becomes a uh, matrix multiplication so everything is very fast so the idea of this um, of the state space models is that you have a hidden state that you are updating at every time step based on the previous hidden state and the current inputs that you have and these are updated just by these two matrices A and B. And then to make a prediction, you're multiplying the hidden state by, an, by a third matrix C, and you're getting your output. So these are all linear operations. And because they are linear operations, you can take this, uh, for example, if you had, if your the length of your sequence would be three, you can build, uh, well, in this case, it's a, it's a convolution operation based on, on this kernel, but you can look back uh, at the, and because these are fixed terms also, then that's important. You can simply, if you have, for example, a sequence length of three, you can simply take uh, the previous time step. So th this would be a prediction based on the previous time step, a prediction based on the second previous time step up to a K term. And then you can build this, uh, this kernel, and then you can simply multiply matrix multiplication between the inputs and this kernel to the, get a specific prediction of the model. So these are all linear operations. And one of the attractive things about this state space models, and this is also something that they mentioned in this paper by, uh, by the authors that I will show in the next slide about Mamba, is that it is super fast. And this is very different because typically you would have in recurrent neural networks some kind of nonlinearity that is added. And it is also present in this state space model by this discretization term. So you can see that initially the, the equations of the model are showing continuous time, but typically you will have, we would have a, a sequence that has discrete time steps. So this is where your, this delta parameter comes into play 
where you build from this continuous uh, representation or this continuous uh, matrix that would be, or this matrix that would be used to update the hidden state in, in continuous time or in, in a continuous setting, you have to um, do some operations on it to move into a sequence that is discrete. So this is where the non-linearities uh, come into play. And this is based, um, and these are some of the rules that can be used to create this A bar matrix and this B bar matrix. So these are not unique. These are just the, uh, the operations that they present in this particular paper, but these are not, uh, there, there could be more operations that can be used to uh, translate from continuous to discrete time. Manuel, oh, you have time. a yes. question. Yep. Okay. Well, I guess that's not a proper matrix exponential, right? So that's a uh, component by exponential. I would guess so, yes. Oh, okay. So then it's not getting too worse, <laughs> too bad. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and, and this is just one of the specific rules that they uh, show in this paper, like the translation from continuous to the add from a continuous setting to a discrete setting can use any number of different operations. So it's it's dependent and this is what they show in this paper, but there are other ways that you could do this operation. So having this background of state space models, what they introduce in this MAMBA paper, which is by Guan Dao, is this state space models that use selection. So the method that they propose is to let the parameters that affect the interaction along the sequence, so this delta B and C, be selectively input dependent. So, and this is the overall architecture of this selective state space models. So you have a, a hidden state that goes along in a sequence. And this is the transition matrix A that is a constant in time that is used to update uh, the hidden state. But this, uh, this operation, as you saw previously from the equations, also has to take into account the inputs. And typically, this B, this B matrix and this C matrix would be fixed. But the idea of this selective, uh, or yeah, so the idea of state space models with selection is that this B matrix and C matrix and also the delta parameter are affected by the inputs that you have to the model. So the inputs are, they say, projected into these matrices and the matrices change based on a particular input that you have a, a, at a specific point along a sequence. Yep. Um, yes, Manuel, I have a question there. The, the input are just for the same time step or they have kind of sequence there? I know, I don't know, just the precipitation on many days in the past. No, th this is just for this particular time step, there is an XT, which can have uh, any number of inputs. So this could be, well, in our hydrology setting, rainfall, about transpiration. Okay, uh, so there are different inputs in Valia, really. So in, in this sense, it's kind of similar to what LSEM is doing, because this kind of metrics in some way are the gates that we have in LSEM. That are yes. receiving the input. So in some way, probably we can make this kind of, kind of comparison there in some moment. Yes, it's actually, well, this paper is very nice if anyone would like to take a look to the paper because they, one of the things that they do is they try to um, comment on the similarities that this approach has to recurrent neural networks, how the gates in, in, in LSTMs, for example, can be similar to this updating operations of the of the transition matrices. So yeah, it's very similar. It's, I guess it's a, it's a different point of view of how you do sequence modeling, a different paradigm to how, how you do sequence modeling. And this selective state space model is what is used in, in this Mamba model as, as a block which also includes uh, more additional components uh, using traditional neural networks. So 
if you have seen the architecture of, uh, of GPT, for example, you know that a transformer is a specific component along a larger architecture of the overall model. So also in Mamba, this is just a specific component of the overall architecture or this selective space type, space phase model is a specific component of the of a larger architecture. And well, I, I wanted to talk about this paradigm of state space model and, and Mamba because it's becoming very popular. But ultimately, uh, what I wanted is to give the perspective that you can, using uh, machine learning, you could get an abstract set of states which capture the behavior of the dynamical system and its trajectory. So this is a very simplified scheme where basically in, in, in a certain way, you have a, a state that is X in this case, that is through some model or through a neural network updated by the previous state and the inputs that you have at that time step. And it, it is using this state abstract set of states that I would see being able to apply the information bottleneck where you layer in a state representation that is maximally expressive about the outputs while being maximally compressive about, about the inputs. So using the information model. And um, well, as we already discussed a little bit, uh, applying the, the information bottleneck is, is uh, complicated. Uh, and, and also in, in the case of time series, it, it's a, a little bit, it's more complex. But there are approaches that have been proposed in order to be able to uh, calculate by proxy or use the information bottleneck to minimize or maximize a loss function based on the information bottleneck through some sort of variational approximation. So the variational information bottleneck is something that was proposed in, in 2019. And the idea is that you have the equation of, of the uh, information bottleneck but you can get a lower bound of this uh, of the of the information bottleneck, and this can become your new loss function. And it, and it is something that you are able to calculate because the state space representation, and in this case, they mentioned it, or well, this would be the lower bound that they describe in, in this particular paper. And they say that the this term of p of z given x is a probabilistic encoder. Q of, of Y given Z is a probabilistic decoder and R of Z is a, a prior that you set on, on the state space. And these could all be variational approximations of, of the true distributions that this model would take. And typically these are given by Gaussian distributions. And when you have a Gaussian distribution in, in the setting, um, there's an explicit solution for mutual information for Gaussian distributions. And it is uh, something that you would be able to use to develop your model. And by proxy, you are using the information bottleneck. And this is also something that is very common where you want to maximize or minimize a quantity that is very difficult to calculate. So you're trying to do the same on something different that is easy to calculate. And by proxy, you're doing it or by proxy, you're going, getting the same result as uh, using the, the true equation of the information bottleneck, for example. So those are some of the ideas that could be, that I, I think could be seen in the future in model development, not only in hydrological models, and, but also in geoscientific models in general. And that's uh, all of the presentation. The, the next slide are the references. So thank you very much for your attention. And if there's any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them. Holger? So Manuel, first of all, thanks a lot for all this uh, insight. I don't know much about um, hydrological modeling and things like that. So it was very interesting. And I think the second part, as you as you said in the end, it's not only for um geological or hydrological. I'm more in 
ecological modeling and yeah i would say there is a lot of potential too but i was wondering in the first half towards the end of the first half you were presenting the a, a, a figure of parameter identifiability and all those um the 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 axis both the x and the y axis were uh, relative right so parameters were only um hard to identify relative to how hard other parameters i are identifiable so yeah exactly this one so um for example beta is half as hard to be identified as alpha or something but that doesn't tell you at all how hard they are really identifiable i mean this this uh, this approach of presenting a relative parameter identifiability problem seems to hide a lot of difficult information and i if i were a reviewer i would be kind of uh, suspicious here what do you think about that i think it's yes it, it is a relative um, process of, of yeah it, it's given in in terms of or I think what they do in the paper is that they, this is a quasi Newton scheme that constantly updates the, the parameters of the model. And they use the same number of time steps or the update steps for each of the models. So I, I think these are relatives, but they are keeping the same conditions for all the optimization schemes that they use. Yeah, but this means that if from the beginning for all the optimization schemes they use, the problem is very, very difficult. They just hide this difficulty. Mm. I mean, I like the idea. If I want to present something, uh, I, I, I have now another option to uh, to hide my <laughs> to hide my problems with parameter identification. <laughs> yeah, the other question I had um, was. Um, it is um, that sometimes the machine learning algorithm finds really, really different uh, results than what you would uh, give there as an expert knowledge equation, huh? which is interesting, right? So, I mean, for some catchments, there are really different uh, uh, results from the machine learning, but shouldn't they be kind of the same? Otherwise, you cannot rely on anything. I think there's... In the process equations that you defined, they they were, and I think in a, in a lot of cases, for example, uh, equations that are given to calculate uh, real about the transformation, for example, are, are results of, in a lot of cases of, of regression uh, on data that is collected for specific sites, or or the, or the data that was used to develop that those equations may not be uh, comparable to other sides. So I think somehow these relationships that you're finding on, on the models that are based on, on neural networks are giving you an idea of the process that is, or or yeah, the, the process in this specific area that is generating about the transpiration, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it might be different. Uh, than the, than the equations that you would define in, in a traditional model, but they answer more to the data that is available to a specific study area, for example. So this seems like in the end, it's beneficial to have kind of both and, and, and then see what each one can tell you and make the best of it. Yep, I agree. Well, you would hope that you could use the information coming out of the neural network to guide a better conceptual physical representation. So uh, if you take these two examples, they're interesting, but they're kind of trivial in a sense. But the original model assumes that discharge is, independent, is not dependent directly on rainfall, but it just depends only on the state, whereas you could see, and you can make a, a very good conceptual argument for why the outflow should depend also on the rainfall under certain conditions uh, because you have infiltration excess and saturation excess runoff and you know complicated mechanisms that come in. Uh, with the evapotranspiration, it's interesting because the theoretical evapotranspiration equations are usually not based directly on data that we use in our models. 
And so they are approximated. So for example, they use temperature or something else as a surrogate for energy availability, um, uh, relative humidity uh, may or may not be, be playing a role. Uh, and so uh, there's a number of papers out there about potential evapotranspiration, uh, which show that, you know, the, the, the classical equations that are used in hydrology are not really quite good or accurate. Isn't there a, a conceptual issue? Like um, you look at the output of the of the machine learning model, and then with this output, you come up with conceptual equations. Shouldn't it be conceptually right? You first come up with the equations, and then you test them. Yeah, yeah, but we you may or may not be able to develop a evaporation equation which conceptually from first principles easily, which depends directly on temperature. If you can, you're right. That would be perfect. That that's ideally. And this this is sort of trying to push you towards uh, trying to understand what it would be like. What would you have to take into account to do that? Yeah, I get so if you cannot do that's the best you can do, basically. I mean, all the equations that we use are, I would say, more empirical than not. Anyway, usually people put data on a plot, they scatter plot, and they fit a curve through it. <laughs> And they ignore other dimensions which are causing that scatter, right? So, so Manuel, your hope is to use uh, this kind of approach as the guidance towards developing a methodology. Is that is that uh, what I sort of? read under the surface of what you were trying to say? Uh, I think exactly this, that, yeah, the, maybe the process equations that are typically defined in, in hydrological models are very strict to certain conditions and certain study areas. So it would be nice to see how the data that is available for different study areas is able to inform uh, a model. And then from that model, be able to um, extract or yeah, guide the generation of this mechanistic equations that could be more uh, or would resemble what would be traditionally used in the model. In a sense, you're trying to move towards an artificial intelligence in the sense you're saying that if human beings could go through a series of logical reasoning processes based on a certain amount of data that's available, why could you not write a neural network which learns uh, to make those same decisions or so something similar based on the available data. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, the available data is, is something that is very valuable and something that is often only used for validation and could be used for model development by itself. I know from soil moisture data here in Sweden, which is amazing and great, and people are very proud of it, that another research group says, yeah, it's all crap. <laughs> so so um, relying just on data is, I think it's also very dangerous. So um, you should not completely lose the, the understanding behind and the conceptual equation, because sometimes maps and models and data, maps and data look really good, and another, another research group comes and says, yeah, but they have done this mistake in the beginning of their study. And and so it's very dangerous just to rely on data that seems out there and it's a lot and it looks good and but it's super dangerous. Yeah, in fact, in the second plot there, we, when, we, when we have uh, M50, we have evapotranspiration for temperature that are negative. Yep. So in some sense, we know that this is not true, but the model got a very good result, probably exploring this this part of the space. So if the model is fixing the I don't know error in the structure or in the data, something we don't know really. So trust Sorry. completely in the result. Where did you get negative? Sorry, I'm missing. When you have a zero temperature, you will have some ET, for example, for more than thousand. Okay. 
Yeah, we'll be doing yeah there, this area. Um, it could mean condensation. So yeah, but there's something else. <laughs> yes. When you go to M100, it sort of disappears, right? So it's an approximation. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's where you could balance the two approaches. So physical principles and also the, what the data tells you in combination should be able to inform what the real process that is happening. Manuel, in that case, if you are trying to inform the model based on the data, will it be valuable to refine the data that you are going to use? Um, because if you include certain events that are very atypical of the behavior of the of the basin, um, will that drive the responses um, to paths that are actually not feasible or that, that are feasible but not as frequent as, as you may think? I think the well, you should be able to model the behavior of the system, but and this uh, events that are less frequent should be also be modeled or be able to capture by the model. So they should definitely be included in, in the data. But then, yeah, it would be because they are less frequent, then you there's less representation in the training data, so they might be more difficult to capture or more difficult to inform the overall model about these specific processes. So it, it's, you would have to, I, I think you would have to make adjustments for these specific events if you want a model that is for this specific event. Um, so question here, Manuel. Um, neural ODs uh, put everything in a framework or paradigm, which is consistent with the way uh, people like to represent dynamical systems in, in, in physics or in science, because you have rate of change on the left-hand side and um, fluxes on the right-hand side. Um, but the problem with neural ODEs, potentially any kind of thing, is you have to do numerical integration. And this can result in both lot high computational cost and challenge when you have stiff equations and so on. Um, you, you may be aware of another approach that's being developed called uh, liquid time constant networks, where they use uh, 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 something similar to a gated neural, recurrent neural networks, but where the gating mechanism is um, uh, uh, has a variable time term in it so that the magnitude of the gating actually changes depending on the depending on the length of the time um, and in that case you don't you don't have to do numerical integration because the, in some sense the numerical integration has been done before you actually implement your model I'm just curious whether you've run seen that or whether you've thought about using that instead of neural ODs I, I haven't seen them. I, I think um, currently there's a lot of research being done on neural ODEs because actually the integration schemes for ordinary differential equations are fairly robust. And that's why they are there are a lot of people who are working on, on this specific field. Mm -hmm. But I, I, will, I will definitely take a look. I would suggest that because actually even looking at Mamba where you have your a matrices, which are variable, depending on the delta, the time constant that, that you put in, it seems to me there's a there's some analogical similarity between the theory that they put into liquid time constant networks. Um, at the Hydro ML in um, in 2023, there was a talk about uh, given by a group that's doing a global circulation model scale modeling and they were using these liquid time constant uh, networks in order to be able to speed up the calculations. But I think 
now that I've seen what you presented here, I think there's a very close relationship between Mamba and neural ODs and this. I mean, you saw the neural OD Mamba relationship, mm -hmm. but this may be another uh, uh, related issue. Yeah. Holger. I just wanted to say something about this issue with um, combining machine learning algorithms with restrictions like from physical laws. We had this in uh, on the Zugspitze in the workshop where Gray Neering said that usually adding such restrictions really lowers the predictive capability. It's the, the topic also Josef was talking about. And I think it's totally true that um, adding restrictions there lowers predictability. And it's the same I've experienced it many, many times in classical optimization algorithms. If in each optimization step, you have this restriction, the algorithm is too restricted to find the optimization, right? So I think in the end, you should you should leave the algorithm all freedom to optimize whatever violating all laws you can find. But in the end, you have to uh, verify that all the laws that you really require are, are kept. How the algorithm gets there, you don't care. You don't have to care. You don't need to know. That's not important. And um, we had recently during lunch here, uh, we had a, a conversation where somebody brought it up uh, saying, yeah, that's actually how I do science. You know? so I, I just do totally useless things. You have no idea violating all the rules. But in the end, it all falls together and it makes sense. I think you're suggesting, Holger, that the search path should not be constrained. But once you get that, to the conclusion, then you want to impose the constraints. That's what I'm suggesting. And I'm not sure how how standardized this is. I, I think it's not standardized. Well, when you do Lagrangian constraint-based optimization, uh, you have the option to, to relax the Lagrangian parameter, right? So that the constraints don't play a strong role while you're trying to find your way to the solution. Well, then, then you should use that. <laughs> and but, uh, in the end, you should never forget then to check that in the end, you're in the right ballpark. <laughs> in some sense, that's also similar in the uh, information bottleneck equation there, that beta term, you could start by making it zero mm. and then you could slowly increase the value. Yeah. So you have to build an optimization around the optimization in a sense. Yeah. And Holger, I, think that's not, I think that's not yet standardized. Holger, have you, have you tried doing anything along the lines of like just completely running the optimization with no constraints and then, you know, projecting onto the space with like minimum Wasserstein distance or something like that? I mean, uh, have you explored any of? Uh, I was I was I was doing um, one example was I was trying to find um kind of model parameters by entropy maximization. And when I restricted the, and under under the CERC, for, it was for a carbon transport, a, a carbon cycle model, and I was, the restriction was that in the end, the, the mean transit time for the system had, had a fixed value. And when I had this restriction for all the steps, for, for each optimization step, the algorithm did really, really, really bad. If I just let the algorithm do free and check at the very end, if now we are there, then it was it was great. So it, uh, you you have to give the the optimization algorithms a lot of freedom, but still try to get them in the right ballpark. But what if you impose the constraint on like the millionth step onwards? Does does that start working or still could, could I I have never tried. I've never okay. tried, but could could be an option because, as you say, I think in in particular the first steps are probably the most important ones, right? Yeah, that could be an option. Manuel, I just uh, add, added a paper about the liquid time constant networks. I'm not sure it's the best one, but it's one I saw recently. Thank you. So some of the challenges you have to deal with, Manuel, are 
being able to calculate those inf mutual information terms. Is that, that, I think I heard you say that's kind of what you're digging into right now. Yes. Okay. And well, I think in, in time series, I'm not sure why it's not something that it is so, or there's so much focus in time series. I, the, the standard paper that they uh, recommend for approaching the information information bottleneck and calculating mutual information is this variational approach. But again, uh, the, uh, the example that they show in this paper is in MNIST. So it's in classification of digits. So it's, it's still difficult to to move into this space of, of time series. But there are some approaches, as I mentioned, of a couple of papers that I have seen. And maybe I can show share the slides because those are in, in the references at the end, where they are uh, applying the information bottleneck in molecular dynamics, which is uh, yeah, time sequences uh, that they have about specific particles. And I have seen it applied in, in some other settings. So this is what I'm, I'm trying to look into. In principle, I don't see a problem. I mean, if you just have a observed and simulated time series of stream flow, you would just do a scatter plot and calculate the mutual information. And mm -hmm. essentially, time is irrelevant, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, just That's... looking at the joint distribution. So it would be something similar, but in a higher dimensional space. That would be the first approach, but I, I do think that there's and I haven't tried it, so that, that's why I cannot comment on the results of this sure. of such uh, an experiment. But uh, yeah, it, that should be a, an initial step. But then I do think that the time component will be relevant at some point. So I'm still looking into how to incorporate it. I'm not sure what you mean by the time component would be important. You mean like the conditional evolution or? All right, it's 11.45. Uh, Lila, do we, uh, uh, let's thank Manuel. Yes, thanks Manuel, great presentation. Very and, um, thank you. Yeah, if there is no other questions, I just wanna make two uh -huh. quick comments. Thanks. Yeah. What's, and, the, uh, what, what's the plan for the next one? So for the next one in three weeks, um, February 7th, we have then, and he will be discussing language modeling is compression and okay. the camel's compression challenge. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I, I also wanted to say thanks uh, to everyone who has subscribed to the YouTube channel. In the last year, we got uh, more than 20,000 views. <laughs> that is, yes, uh, larger than the 2,000 views that we got in 2022. So yeah, thank you everyone for your contributions. Leila, thanks you for doing all that stuff. And and, and that this increase is basically your your achievement, in my opinion. <laughs> no, it's everyone's effort. So yeah, very happy to be part of it. Thank you everyone and see you in three weeks. All right. Bye-bye.